Welcome to the Carl Jackson Show podcast. This is your daily dose of freedom in a world of confusion and lies. Please subscribe to the podcast wherever you go to get your podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and Rumble. Uh, guys, actually, what we're going to do today is this is uh, this is Monday, the 18th of March, 2024. We've got a couple of shows lined up for you. Uh, the first, because honestly, um, if I'm being honest with you, and I am, uh, we're a couple of shows behind, to be frank with you. And it's Gabe's fault. It is really Gabe's fault. Uh, so I just want you guys to know that. And now that we've got that cleared up and who to blame, we can proceed. But our first guest for today is R.C. Williams. You guys know R.C. As a matter of fact, you love him because uh, the podcasts always do well when he's on. Uh, but R.C. is really good when it comes to markets, financial markets. He's really good when it comes to cryptocurrency, all that kind of stuff. Breaking down the stuff that the average person doesn't necessarily get about finances and the economy and how it's going to impact everyday life, your pocketbook specifically. Uh, so R.C. C. Williams, welcome back to the Carl Jackson Show podcast. Carl, it's great to be with you, brother. Always a pleasure. And I, I'm glad to hear that we do well when I'm on because this ugly mug usually scares people <laughs> away. So I'm glad to hear you. you do well, man. You do well. All right. You can catch RC <laughs> at Sherlock.substack.com. And again, you spell Sherlock differently. All right. Just drop the K S H E R L O C. Also, we are Watchmen dot substack dot com so sherlock dot substack dot com we are watchmen dot substack dot com what's the difference rc and the yeah so uh first off either if you get to either one of those it'll get you to the other uh rip from the headlines which is at sherlock dot substack dot com is our daily look at the news where we break it down for you and simplify it as you mentioned earlier uh, we Are the Watchmen Weekly is an extension for us, and that's where we connect the dots between current events and scripture. So the goal with We Are the Watchmen Weekly is to equip the church to engage the culture. Uh, as you mentioned, Carl, when we deal with markets and economics, um, that is an area where we work to inform as much as possible. When it comes to helping believers to engage the culture, which is decaying, because the church yeah. has actually abdicated its leadership role, we said, what's the best way to get to people who are looking for answers? Because right now, non-believers are like, what's wrong? The world's upside down. I don't have answers. There's a disease in their spirit. And so the Lord put the calling on us that the most effective way to get to them and to equip the church was to take events that are happening every day and then connect the dots with scripture uh, to help people understand. Just this past Saturday, when we publish, we publish every Saturday, uh, we had part one of an in-depth interview with Bill Federer. Uh, Bill is an amazing author and historian, and his ability to connect the dots between the church and the history of mm. the United States is absolutely unmatched. And so oh, he takes what's amazing. happening today. He gives you hundreds of thousands of years of context, Carl, as to how we got where we were and why the United States at its core is a Christian nation and how those things show up in our everyday life and honestly how they're being destroyed. His parallels are are beyond anything that, that myself or Juliana, who is my co-publisher, spouse, and, and co-host, um, could, could ever imagine. So, you know, we are the Watchmen Weekly. I'll say this to the audience. When the Lord calls you to do something, listen. Because while on the surface, you may say, oh, if I have to do that, then that means I have to do this. I'll tell you what, it takes little to no effort to publish We Are the Watchmen Weekly every week because it's not us. It's the Lord doing the work. Uh, and he's done some amazing things through us. So that, that's the difference between the two, Carl. We always encourage people to read both, uh, understand what's going on with your markets every day. And then when you have an opportunity to witness to somebody, you are prepared to do that and to convict them because let's be honest, there are a lot of people looking for answers and where in the past they may have laughed off the church. Today, that's not happening. People are serious and they're like, listen, mm -hmm. this world is upside down and I need to have some answers as to what's going on. You know, that's that's so well said, RC. And I, I got to tell you, convicting as well. I'm sure uh, Gabe will be going to the altar this weekend, uh, but it's uh, and he definitely needs to just to be uh, for all of you guys in the listening audience. But no, in all seriousness, oh. I, I, I mean, that's that, that <laughs> in all seriousness, it's a great response. And I, I got to tell you, RC, that's that's why I started off talking about politics, because I saw this gap that existed between or this disconnect, I should say, probably a better word between the church and and and, and the culture and the, and, and the church and, and politics. 
And it was it was weird to me because when and and I know we're going off on a on a bit of a tangent, but I'm just going to follow this conversation where it goes because I, I feel like the Lord is leading this right now. To be honest with you, and so um, you know I, I can just remember getting uh, when God saved me from the heathenish lifestyle. Uh, that uh, that I was living and from the you know from the wrath of God if you will that's what we believe when we say that we're saved you're saved from the wrath of God mm -hmm. for those of you that are in the uh, for those of you that are in the listening audience but he gave me a love and a passion for politics that I never had before I mean I, I thought I knew politics because I lift, listened to ETV and a lot of left wing organizations. I thought I was informed when the left wingers right. talked about certain issues. But, you know, I grew up with uh, with with the biblical worldview, albeit a cult initially when I was uh, younger. Uh, that's a story for another day. But but so I had some biblical foundation. So I, I could always kind of edge my thinking with some of the things that the left was saying. But man, when God radically changed my thinking, changed my mind. Oh, sorry. When I got saved, it was just, it was totally different. And what I didn't understand is that when I started attending, uh, attending church, and I believe that I attend a good Bible preaching, uh, teaching church and a church that oftentimes did talk about political issues, but there still seemed to be uh, not enough or a bit of a lax. Um, and, and in general, I didn't understand this. I, I was like, I, I don't get why the church doesn't talk about these issues because the left are using this is these issues in order to undermine the church. And I think, RC, we've seen that come full circle. I mean, now you you hear this term Christian nationalism used as a pejorative. And I'm like, OK, if Christian nationalism means that I want uh, the rule of law if it means that I want free speech, if it means that uh, I'm pro-life, if it means that I get to express my religious beliefs in the United States of America, uh, I don't know. Call me a Christian nationalist. All good. You, you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But but I, I just feel like the church is just and it's so crucial right now. And I promise you guys, we're going to get to RC's work on uh, get you informed on on the economy and all this kind of stuff. But he went there and I just felt like, you know, I kind of felt led to go there myself. Uh, but but. But your take too, RC, just on the importance of the church being involved in 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 the culture, I I, I just I I don't get it. I think some churches are starting to wake up. Pastor John MacArthur, for the longest time, you know, fabulous preacher, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely love him. You want to make that emphatically clear. But I remember years ago, him just kind of seemed to me bashing politics. And I'm like, dude, I don't get it. How how can you tell Christians to go into the workforce that they're doctors, lawyers, teachers, plumbers, whatever, but politics we're somehow supposed to stay away from? Didn't make sense to me. Anyway, that's a long, long, I don't know where I was going with that, RC, but I felt like I needed to say it, but your take. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, God created government. And I, I think that gets lost in the shuffle. Um, people yeah. forget that, you know, you, it's not an it's not an either you are or you aren't. And what a lot of churches will say is we just preach the gospel. And, and a dear friend of ours, Pastor Dan Fisher, who's in Oklahoma City, has actually written a book on Romans 13 called Unlimited Submission with a question mark for those who are uninformed. Romans 13 in the New Testament of the Bible basically says you need to submit to authority because all authority is created by God. Submit to your worldly governors. Except there's a, there's a caveat there. If those leaders are not conformed to God's word, are you supposed to follow them? Are you supposed to just submit, just unlimited submission? Look at COVID. Right. Look at all the bad decisions yeah. that were made by people who were supposedly in charge. And for the majority of churches, the answer was Romans 13, Romans 13, Romans 13. No, not Romans 13. Yeah. It actually starts in the book of Acts where Peter says, no, they're not following the word of God. Therefore, we're not going to follow them. And there are numerous examples in the Bible where believers and those who were prophets of God stood up. I mean, if you think about the asbestos boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who got thrown in the fire, what happened? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar is a king, right? He says, I'm God. Uh, every time that, that I sound the horn, you kneel to my statue. And they're like, that's not going to happen, pal. Uh, I answer to a higher authority, as they used to say in the old Hebrew national commercials, right? So he throws them in the fire, and guess what happens? <laughs> Nothing happens to them, right? Because they stood up 
to a worldly authority that was not of God. And you know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Right at that moment, he said, your God is God. He was convicted Mm. after he saw this. So don't ever think that because you're a believer and you go to church, that you're not supposed to be involved. And by the way, if your pastor tells you that at church, go find another church. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, very... Very good word. Very good word. No doubt about it. Um, it's it. it I, I just look at the 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 rot uh, in society, and I was reading through this book. Uh, and again, I, <laughs> I'm speaking to R.C. Williams. I, I I didn't intend to go here, but I, I just feel like, hey, man, this is where the conversation is going. But uh, I was reading a book by Erwin Lutzer. Uh, or through a book by Erwin Lutzer over the weekend, We Shall Not Be Silenced, or something to that effect, and just breaking down Marxism and what Karl Marx and Frederick Engels sought to do and how they sought to literally destroy uh, the nuclear family, man, woman, and child, and the reasons they they wanted mm-hmm. to do it, to, to completely undermine it. I mean, in order for uh, people to serve government over God, the, they had to attack uh, the nuclear family because they believed that if you, uh, if you belong to a nuclear family, you had an advantage. You had, a, uh, you had an advantage for, uh, for success. And, and so you were kind of selfish because you gave your property and your wealth, you passed it on to your children instead of passing it on to the community, you know. And uh, But if people have parents, if they come from two parent homes, they're likely to do better. And that's if you live in the hood. That's if you live in the burbs. It doesn't matter. That's just a it, 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 it's, it's just a fact. And the left has done such a great job of demolishing the concept or minimizing uh, the concept and even demonizing in some cases, the concept of man, woman, uh, man, woman, and child. And the goal was, as he writes in his book and in part to destroy the nuclear family. But one way you do it is you tell wives, wait a minute, your husband, your husband is the, is the oppressor. Um, And, and, and ultimately Mm -hmm. these women would follow that. And, and then it leads to, you know, it just leads to the furtherance of Marxism because you get people, both men and women that believe in this nonsense, they get into academia, so on. All right. So that's another long tangent I've gone off on. I'll let you respond to that and then we'll move on to some economics, (laughs) RC. You know, isn't it interesting? And this actually does tie into economics, Carl, is how Marxism, communism, pick your, your ism, this, there's kind of this modernism that is, I'd almost say, like a lazy Marxism. Like generations are so lazy that they don't even want to follow all the tenets. They're just like, let's find the ones that get us the maximum bang for the buck. Uh, ultimately, oh, a divide and conquer strategy is that that's Satan's wheelhouse, right? There's nothing new under the sun. It's just dressed up with a new name. BLM is Marxism. These other organizations, Antifa, Mm. Marxism, right? It's the same tenets that run the Communist Manifesto from Karl Marx and something we strongly encourage people to do if you want to understand how your enemy's coming at you and how they're going to come at you every single time is read Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. His 13 Rules for Radicals are the same game plan that they run on you every single time. And the only reason that they continue to get away with it is because you are not informed. If you understood how the game was played, right? And and so God is no respecter of men. When you come to the judgment seat, ignorance is not going to be an excuse, right? When you're judged, he's not going to say, oh, well, you you didn't know, even though you did know it was out there, you didn't do anything about it. So, okay. No, 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 no. It was available to you. Shows like this said, hey, you need to be paying attention to these things and your choice not to uh, ultimately has consequences now. And then uh, when you head upstairs uh, to, to talk to the big guy about what's going on and, and what you did when he asked you to give an account of your life. Hmm. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Hey, real quick, before we move on, I want to talk to the listening audience about MyPillow.com. Mike Lindell has a passion to help you get the best sleep of your life. After he invented the world's best pillow, he created the famous Giza Dream Sheets. They are the best sheets you'll ever sleep on. Guys, I'm going to attest to this. I Listen, I'm not somebody just trying to sell stuff to you, although this is part of the job, but I'm just being real with you. I love his stuff. Any one of his products that I buy or any of the products that I buy from MyPillow.com, as God is my witness, they become my favorite product. The pillows, uh, the sheets, the slippers, the towels, I absolutely love. I know that sounds weird, but 
Uh, I take long showers. I like to make sure that I'm dry afterwards. I love the soft, old school feel. Um, and those towels do it. I absolutely love them. So for a limited time, you can get a queen size set for $59.98, king size just for $69.98. The lowest prices in history, as a matter of fact. Mike and my pillow continue to be canceled by big box stores, and they are attacked by the mainstream media. So they appreciate all of your great support during these times, and they want to thank you by giving you free shipping on your entire order uh, today. All right, so to, to get these specials, all you have to do is go to MyPillow.com, or you can call 800-858-0263. If you go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square at the top of the page and enter my name, Carl, C-A-R-L. I don't spell it like the Marxist, uh, so don't use K-C-A-R-L, or give them a call. 800-858-0263, 800-858-0263. You get the famous Giza Dream Sheets, queen size for $59.98 and a king size for just 10 bucks more. You'll also get 60% off of the original My Slippers. All right, so you can call 800-858-0263 or go to MyPillow.com, promo code CARL for free shipping today. All right, now let's get back to R.C. Williams. He is uh, the co would you co-founder because it's both you and you and your wife, right? So co-founder is that what you would That's say, fine. R.C.? All right, so Sherlock.substack.com yep. is where you can go to subscribe to R.C.'s work. And if you're he, if you're interested, and I know you are, if you're listening to this podcast of not just where the economy is, but where it might be going. And to have a biblical worldview uh, tied to that, I mean, obviously, the Sherlock.substack.com is is the everyday financial activities. Uh, watch, uh, we are Watchmen. I'm sorry. .substack.com, as RC explained, kind of gives you a the macro, the biblical worldview, the macro uh, look over things. So make sure you check him out. All right, RC, let's let's get to this because. Um, you texted me about this. This news broke last week, um, and obviously it's a big deal. We'll just take these issues one by one and let you break them down to the audience sure. and what you see happening in the economy. And again, guys, it is uh, it, it is March, what, 18th? Man, I'm forgetting the dates here. Um, I'll get to another podcast shortly. We'll get to Trump's comments. What did he say? Bloodthirsty, blood something, bloodbath. Who gives a flip? Uh, the, the the media is going to find every little term to be outraged from now until eternity uh, with Trump, uh, but also obviously up until the election. But we will get to that uh, in our next podcast. But let's get to this issue. Family Dollar is closing 1,000 stores, RC. This is obviously uh, going to impact people. Uh, particularly that are that are on a on on a serious budget, uh, many people that are in low income areas, frankly, where a lot of these places are. I actually have one that's right down the street from me. Um, I, I believe it's a Dollar General, if I'm not mistaken, or it's Family Dollar. It's one of them, um, and and, uh, and and so it's even in communities where it's you know middle class communities, you can find these places because you have people that are obviously hurting from Biden inflation that are starting to shop at places like the dollar store that they never thought they'd be shopping at. And now you have 1000 of them closing across the nation. So Carl, it is interesting. The one business model that you would think that would be resilient through anything, a uh, bad analogy, but I'll use it anyway. It's like the cockroach of the industry, right? It won't die even if you drop a nuke on it. <laughs> um, Dollar right. General, yeah, the, the, the parent company of, of, for Dollar General acquired Family Dollar. So there was a consolidation in the industry of dollar stores. And what they quickly discovered is that much like in Escape from L.A., where it was told to uh, Snake Plissken that this city can kill anybody, um, Biden inflation and the Joe Biden economy can kill anything, including the dollar store model. Here's what's interesting, Carl. Right, the point. family dollar portion of that is predominantly in underserved communities around the country. If you drive through one, you're going to see one. Dollar General is generally considered uh, a more middle class. So you okay, might see so those in some rural areas. Okay. But yeah, yeah. Or, or you would see them in, a, in a, a middle class community, right? They're there because people are shopping for value. We found it interesting that a group, whatever their forecasts were, what they did not do is they did not properly account for a black swan. So basically what happens is that number crunchers look and say, hey, if it was Carl and I sitting there, I'd say, hey, Carl, I'm a bean counter. Listen, 
we own Dollar General. If we buy Family Dollar and we consolidate the industry, we'll own the entire market share. And even if we tick up our price, because now it's really the Dollar Twenty Five store. If you if you tick up the price right. just a hair, um, you know we'll still be okay. But what they didn't account for is that people were going to be so squeezed. And that the price of everything was going to go up 30 to 40 percent, that it would simply be bad economically to keep stores open and they'd have to shut them down. So I share all that to share this. Folks, when you look at the economy or you talk to your financial advisor, and this is not financial advice, this is not that type of show, we're not those type of professionals, right? We provide trends and, and various guidance. But that said, everything that you've been led to believe about how the economy has traditionally worked is starting to chip away. Reason being, you've been fed a line of BS for years. And now we're finally at the end of the train track. And all it took is it just the complete idiocy in administration today for it to be completely exploited. Let's think logically and simply. Who in their right mind, as the leader of the free world, decides to cut off his country's ability to produce energy or gas, and then yeah. to sell the reserves that you have to someone who is your enemy, documented. Well, a natural fallout from that, Carl, is we're gonna end up in a situation that the very place that is designed to help people who are looking for bargains or who are desperate and, and need some time and still need to get products, you get to the point now where you can't even Man. keep those open. What does that tell you about where we're at and where we're going? You know, that is a sobering thought. I mean, literally, you you hear of a dollar store, dollar stores closing 1,000, and then immediately my reaction was like, what, really? You know, but, but yeah, you do have to look at this stuff uh, from the bird's eye uh, perspective. If, if, if they weren't ready for Biden inflation, Good God Almighty! I, I mean, I honestly, you 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 have to do your best to get prepared in in the times that are coming because uh, the dollar just isn't worth as much. I don't suspect it's going to be worth as much. The only way that you're going to outpace inflation in today's uh, today's markets, it seems to me, is if you're you know good at investing uh, or you're you know you have some real estate. But then uh, you have this I, this concept of the great taking. Have you heard of this, RC? Where literally they, I mean, even if you own your property, I, I wasn't even aware of this. Or right? even if you own your property, you have these stakeholders that that will go back and look at mortgages, even though you've paid them off, and be like, "Well, that's what they're trying to do now." Like, well, you, I, I forget the the entire explanation, but it's insane. But basically, they're saying, "Well, no, you don't own it, even though you paid it off." I mean, th this is what these globalist elites are trying to do. Like they're literally, even if you have managed to defeat them, so to speak, and their 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 crazy Marxist, you know, implementation across or around the globe, they're going to figure out ways in order to try to confiscate goods, even from those of us that try to think ahead of the game. These people are evil. We're just dealing with evil people. All right. So this was an interesting one. Um, and actually, let's do this, RC. Let's touch on a couple of the uh, uh, let's touch on a couple of topics we talked about before uh, we came online. Some of the headlines that are out today, we may as well get to them. Uh, let's hear inflation may mm -hmm. keep interest rates higher for longer uh, than expected. This is from the Financial Times. Uh, Fed will have to keep rates high for longer than markets anticipate, according to economists. Um, so this comes from the uh, Chicago Booth poll suggests banks will make two or fewer cuts this year, with the first being between July and September. The Federal Reserve will be forced to hold interest rates at a high level for longer than markets and central bankers anticipate. Um, this, according to the academic economist polled by Financial Times, it says here more than two thirds of those survey surveyed in Financial Times Chicago booth poll think the Fed will make two or more fewer cuts this year. All right. So it's just redundant at this point. So. All right. So the Federal Reserve will be forced to hold interest rates at a higher level for longer than markets and central bankers anticipate. Um, so your take on this, R.C.? Interesting, Carl. It's like wherever you go, there you are. I think that's the old joke, right? So if people were to go back 
And listen, you know, we've been on with you a number of times, both on the podcast and on the radio network. And we've talked about this. I mean, people can go back the better part of a year and a half. And one of the things we talked about is the fallacy that, you know, Janet Yellen decided to go on national television and say inflation right. is transitory. Jerome Powell, Fed chair, same thing. And when they did it, we said, why don't you stop lying to people? It is not transitory. You've made a mess of this thing by giving away tons of free money. And then when Silicon Valley Bank went under, you nationalized the banking system. You had banks in a position where you said, listen, don't keep anything in reserve, guys. It's fine. As soon as that money comes in the door, lend it out. Don't plan for a rainy day. Even though, Carl, as the average person in America, you're always told, you know, sock away for a rainy day. Do this. Invest your money. Meanwhile, these folks are, are going to the casino with a bag full of cocaine uh, and, a, and a wad full of your money, and they're just basically gambling it away. So yeah. what happens when, when you basically run the communist manifesto in real life? Let's give everybody free stuff. Let's give everybody free money. There's no such thing as a free ride. So here we are. The economy is in this weird place because they've managed to screw it up that they said, well, we can tamp down inflation if we jack unemployment. And now they're saying, well, we're at a record for, for not, there's jobs, there's tons of jobs, yet people can't afford to live. You guys, in, in, in your spirit, right, you have this dis-ease because you know inherently things are wrong. It's a long answer to your question, Carl, but here are the brass tacks. You have these people coming out saying, look, we're going to cut interest rates. We're going to do this. Everything's going to be fine. This is transitory and temporary. And now look at the headlines that you're reading. If you go back and watch an edition of the Carl Jackson podcast or listen to one of the radio shows from this time last year, you will hear us say, this is not transitory. We are in an economic position where we're teetering on the edge. We shared a meme the other day where it said basically sum up the economy in a word, and it was a penny rolling up the very, it's at the very top of a hill, getting ready to fall over the other side. There's nothing transitory about this. As a matter of fact, they're saying that they may cut, but realistic right now, Carl, it looks like at best they're going to hold if they don't raise, because honestly, these people have no idea what they're doing. And, and it yeah. pains me to say that because much like you, we, we have friends and family members who are retired, uh, who have done the right thing, who have saved their money, who have invested, and they're enjoying their retirement. They're going to take it on the chin. You know, you and I, we've got enough time left where we can kind of ride this thing out and figure it out. And, and likely we benefit uh, from some of the side effect of saying, OK, in a new world, in a new economy, I actually have to bet my money on things losing. Like conceptually, we can get that. But if you've been retired for a few years and you're kind of out of the mix, this is all new for you. And you've got a financial yeah. advisor who's still working in that realm that has no idea what to do. Carl, it's going to be brutal That's a good point. on people. And right. And, and I, I always joke. We joke about this a lot. I say I feel like the Oracle from The Matrix. When we come on the show, it's like every time I see you, it seems like I have bad news. <laughs> but, but forewarned is forearmed. And if we can get people to understand what's actually happening, then when we talk about the solutions and things that they need to do, it starts to make a lot more sense. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. And honestly, it, 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 that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good place to mention uh, your Substack, RC, we are watchmen.substack.com. I, I am a firm believer in the idea that if the church is informed and if the church has a spine and speaks up, we don't fall to a lot of this stuff. I, I mean, it's really, listen, guys, we're not on this planet to be liked. Everybody likes to be liked. I like to be liked. I, I, I really do. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be hated by people. But I also don't want to go to hell, all right. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna weigh that. I'm, I'm gonna weigh that right. a, a, a little heavier. And and I do think that uh, a biblical worldview. I think it's kind. I think it's compassionate. Um, rule of law, the order, natural law. I mean, these things are very important, very crucial, especially to the United States of America. Um, and and I think we're we're just looks like we're where it looks like we're headed. So I just think the church, if the church is informed in this on this stuff, if the church speaks out, the church kind of serves as a uh, a, a buffer, uh, if you will. I think oftentimes from, 
basically from God's wrath and, you know, and, and, and God's judgment and, and God forbid, just the wackos that want to destroy you, even in a secular sense, the uh, destroy economics uh, or, dis- you know, make you poor, uh, uh, you know, make you believe that men can be women and, 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 and vice versa. Uh, the, the church is mm-hmm. there to preserve it, to preserve, to be salt and light to society. But if we're not talking about this stuff, uh, then we're going to fall prey to it oftentimes, or you're, you're led to a lot of parachurch type organizations uh, that, that really are doing their the best that they can, but don't necessarily always have the pulpit that just a regular church on the corner will, you know, and can have in a small community. It's, it, it's, it's just, it's just, it is what it is. All right. This was very fascinating, RC. Uh, this was something that you texted me. And if you subscribe to Sherlock.substack.com, you can check this uh check where is it at okay i may have hold on let me make sure i get it but i wanted to talk about uh the red alert that you sent me Mm -hmm. oh my god all right anyway i know i know you'll know what i'm talking about i just clicked on the wrong the wrong column here from your sub stack rc but anyway all right you sent me earlier uh red alert the end of the bank term funding program and the implementation of basil three this article that you sent me red alert the end of the bank term funding program and the implementation of basil three rc what the heck is basil three and why should we be concerned about it or basel b-a-s-e-l yeah carl so if we can go back uh a year ago at this time you were bold enough to say rc listen i'm filling in for officer tatum why don't you come on the show and talk to people about what's going on with this this bank program and Silicon Valley Bank and where we're at. A portion of that that we mentioned on the air that night was about the bank temp funding program. So in essence, what happened is that the United States government was about 11 hours away from a total economic implosion. They could not find a buyer for Silicon Valley Bank's assets after they went under. And what was going to happen is it was going to start a run on the banking system. Here's the challenge, that issue is systemic, It was like The Walking Dead. All the banks have the virus. They just haven't died yet, so you don't know. Um, But that was going to create uh, a worldwide effect. So you were going to have a worldwide economic implosion within 48 hours. That was a Sunday. Uh, And then at the very end, they just made it up. They made up the Bank Temp Funding Program, which basically said, listen, if any bank's in trouble, we'll go ahead and insure you to infinity to make sure you don't crash. So that's our basis, right? What happened on March 11th is that that program expired. So there's no more bank window run up to the bank window. If you're a bank in trouble, you know, maybe you decide to spend the money at the casino as a bank owner, and then you have to run and get more money. You can't do that. Okay. So that ran out. Basel three is part two of this. So the Basel Accord is international in nature. And its original design was to make sure that European banks could stay on par with banks in the United States. And it is around reserve requirements for those banks. So what was supposed to happen, Carl, is that if a bank took a dollar from you, it was supposed to keep 10 to 20 cents in reserve, just in case or in case you wanted your money back, right? So across aggregate deposits, there would be enough money. If someone really wanted their money back, the bank could simply give it to them. What happened in 2021 is the U.S. government told banks that they only needed to have nothing in reserve. Hey, (laughs) you're down to zero reserves. Carl gives you a dollar, loan out that dollar, baby, and let's get this economy rolling, right? That was their goal. They said they were going to spark the economy, okay? Here's a challenge, Carl. Basel III has been accepted by the Federal Reserve Board, and what it's going to do uh, over time here is it's going to force the banks to get up to somewhere in the range of 20%, if not more, of reserves. So let's use this practical example. Carl has a house. Carl's house is worth $450,000, hypothetically speaking. And I say to Carl, uh, hey, Carl, I'm the bank, right? You're good. Listen, you're so good that you don't need to worry about homeowner's insurance. So don't worry about it. You're all good, right? And you're like, Carl's like, hey, all right. All right, that's some stuff I don't need to deal with. So you're fine. A couple of years go by. Then I come back to you on a Friday and I say, hey, Carl, listen, you know about that insurance thing? Listen, I'm going to need you to self-insure and I need you to come up with 10% of the value of your house, $45,000. And I need you to sock that away in an escrow account that you can't touch. Oh, and by the way, I need you to have that done by 11.59 p.m. on Sunday, okay? Now, practically speaking, for most Americans, it would be difficult to just come up with $45,000, right? 
That's what's going to happen to the banks when these requirements come down. If a bank has a billion dollars of assets under management, they're magically going to have to come up with 200 million in reserves. Guess what, Carl? In a zero reserve world, yeah. they don't have the money. Yeah. So what's going to happen? Those banks are going to fail. That's why it was an economic red alert. Yeah, it, 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 it's stifling to me. It's almost as if this stuff is being done. It, it's weird. Like there, there, there's an intentionality about this stuff and there's an ineptness about this stuff. Like the, the people that are ruling over us, so to speak, literally have no idea what they're doing. But at the same time, it feels like they're trying to destroy us. And, and, and it's absolutely insane. You know, I was I went back, RC, and I read some of the notes that I had literally um, probably about a year ago or more on these banks that were Silicon Valley Bank. And I forget the name of the others um, and the Biden administration or the Federal Reserve, whatever, uh, decided to to mm -hmm. to prop them up. And I'm like, man, you get these multimillionaires, even billionaires in some cases are likely that are being propped up. Um but not so much the average man. I'm thinking if this that, that had happened, it's insane. And and you know what? I got to be honest with you, RC. I, I I had almost forgot the extent of it. Uh, actually, I did until I went back and read through some notes uh, last night. So just absolutely, we're just living in crazy times. I, I I don't. What do you? What do you? On a practical level, RC, what do you tell people? If they're going to try try and survive and endure this this time of economic turmoil, what what should people be doing, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah, Carl, I, I want to cite something on what you just said because I think it's important for a basis to people uh, for people to understand how your enemy works. So you mentioned that you felt there was an intentionality with what was happening. You would be absolutely correct. If people read the World Economic Forum plan or Agenda 2030 or the UN's 17 Sustainable Goals for Development, you'll see all of these things in there. You just have to look at it through the proper lenses. But as to the question of why, if we are not going to walk willingly into a system that involves a central bank digital currency, programmable money, what the powers that be will do is they will force our hand into that serfdom. And I want people to think about this practically, Carl. We've talked extensively about the central bank digital currency. If you missed any of that, if you just go to the NSA search engine, that's Google, and you type in central bank digital currency, <laughs> you get a full education, you'll see different videos, right? Okay. Here's the thing, Carl. Think about it from the, the side of the, the multimillionaire, the billionaire, or the banker who, who's got control of this, or even the government. If they can get everyone into a central bank digital currency, guess what? They can cover up every financial crime they've ever committed because now they're the bank and they control your money. And if you speak out against it, Carl, they can simply shut it off. So I want to make sure that people have that foundational baseline. I'm actually drawing it out for you here on the screen. OK, now that you understand how they're coming at you, the question of practically how do you survive this? Common sense and common practice are your best friend. So now that you're aware, start to structure your life around being brilliant at the basics. Do you have the basic things you need in stock in the event something happens? Because, and I, I'll say this in all honesty, people miss this. There is an overall economic crisis, but then there are individual economic crises for every family. Mm. The difference between an economic crisis for Carl and RC could be two completely different things. The question to ask yourself on a micro level is, are you prepared? If the answer is no, Right. And you can't point to the fact that, hey, you know what, if something happened for a week, we'd be fine. We wouldn't have to leave the house. We have everything we need. We're fine. You've got to get there first. Right. And you need to build in to make sure that you can sustain a blow, whether that is resource wise or financially. Um, secondarily, you need to start thinking about who you do business with. If you are in J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, guess what? They have the most exposure to derivatives. That's a bunch of crazy things that these people have thrown together and wrapped up as potential investments and sold to someone else. JP Morgan Chase has $55 trillion in derivatives exposure. That's all the bad stuff, okay? $55 trillion. J Just for reference, that's more than the national debt of the United States, okay? These big banks are carrying all this derivatives debt. If you're dealing with them, 
you can practically bet that some bad things are going to happen. And we've already seen those rumbles where you'll see a story where Bank of America or Wells Fargo loses people's money, like their deposits just disappear. Yeah, right? that's right. There's a reason for that. Man, I forgot all Weird about that. Where things happen. Wow. Okay. So think practically about who you do business with. It okay. is easier to work with a community bank or a credit union than it is with a big faceless bank, even though the powers that be want to funnel you into that. You yeah. can fight that by simply doing business with people that you can see every day. And the third one, Carl, which is going to be uncomfortable for some people, but it has to be said, is the reason that these people are winning big is because often they've stacked the deck and they know what to bet against. So yep. just quick finance and economy 101. You can make money when a stock, because that's what most people are familiar with, goes up, much like if you own gold or silver and the price goes up, you've now, your investment has paid you something, right? Just as easily as you can make money when something goes up, you can also make money when something goes down. If you've ever heard the term short yep. or shorting the market, that means that the party that's doing it is betting against a positive result. They're betting on something losing or going down. We have to get really good at figuring out what these people are going to do and either working to block them if it's going to have a significant impact on us or if they're targeting a company that's going to go sideways or they have their hand in the till in some way is how are they doing that? Why are they doing that? Or is there an opportunity to be invested there and also get a return on that. And I know that sounds bad on betting on something to go down, but look, your ability to fight this battle, if you are living hand to mouth, when you're in survival mode, you can't fight other battles. The only battle you're fighting is the one in front of you. You yeah. have to understand how the enemy works and the cannon will work both ways. If you tuck in, like if you read the Financial Times like you did, Carl, if you tuck in underneath what these guys are doing and you see the game they're playing, you can benefit and then you can take those resources and utilize them for the right things. Yep. Yeah, that's on, honestly, that's well said. It's so uh, it's so funny that you mentioned this. I was speaking to someone uh, that was uh, I don't know if I can. I, I th This guy was a trader uh, for a major uh, mm -hmm. uh, not a trader, not a T R A I T O R, but a T R A D E R, uh, not a, st a stock broker, but a trader for actually several companies in 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 his lifetime and in, in his career time, but several financial institutions. I mean, so uh, it's so funny. He was literally having a conversation <laughs> with me about this. He's retired now, but he was having a conversation with mm -hmm. me, friend and a client, about this last week and how he literally goes out and finds the, uh, uh, the, 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 the companies that are being shorted and he invests in them. And he was, it, it, he was straight up. This is a guy that he, how do, how do I explain this? He, he knows what's happening, but he isn't, um, he isn't necessarily political per se. He just understands the game that's being played in the stock markets. And he started talking about George Soros and, you know, blah, 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 and this and that. And, and he wasn't talking about that RC, like, Oh, Carl, I know you're on the right and blah. He was just like, no, that's what these guys do. This is what George Soros is doing. That's what this person is doing. That's what they do. And, 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 and we were just having a casual conversation. I didn't even go to politics with them because frankly, I don't know that he knew uh, that he knew where, where, where I stood. This was just a guy that I know. I happen to be a friend and a client. We're just having a, a conversation. Um, and he was talking about how I could get the most bang for my buck in the stock market and, and right. telling me. And, and I'm just sitting there like he's explaining stuff about economics and financial dynamics and global financial dynamics where it's just like this is what, you know, the Soros is of the world. This is what uh, Jamie Dimon. This is what this this is what they do. So, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, just casually, like nothing. I mean, he was, there was no emotion tied to it whatsoever. This is just the way it's done. And I'm sitting there like, wow. So anyway, just to, uh, just to back up essentially what you were just saying, uh, you, you know, good, ad good advice. Make sure you have something, uh, make sure that you have something in reserves, uh, you know, make sure that you have a rainy day fund, if you will. Dave Ramsey speaks about this stuff all the time. I think it's important to have, you know, a food supply, 
water supply or a water filtration system, um, you know, it, it, if you can do that. I mean, e- even if you guys, if you have just a week worth of food, you're, you're going to be better off than 90, probably 99 percent of Americans. So a week, two weeks, you know, and just just build slowly but surely. You know, I'm not I'm not a, 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 a the best prepper, my my wife and I, but we have enough where we're like, OK, if times hit for this span of time, we, we you know, we have this set aside and, and you just keep building on it. You know, and I know some people might honestly, yep. I, probably a few years ago, I would have thought people were a little cray cray. And now I'm like, no, man, the, we see we are dealing with straight up evil. When it comes to this Biden administration, when it comes to the World Economic Forum, when it comes to the World Health Organization, when it comes to the United Nations, I mean, look at what they're doing to Israel and the precarious position that they're putting uh, they're putting them in when obviously they were the victims. And I'm sorry, war is horrific. It's dangerous. Uh, But I was listening to a gentleman last night that was on. uh, he, He was a statistician, I believe, of sorts from the University of Pennsylvania on Mark Levin's show last night. And he was just breaking down the numbers, how when it comes to Israel and the war against Hamas, how, you know, technically the numbers virtually from war to war to war have virtually been the same. And Israel is actually doing, uh, you know, a tinge better. Now, it's horrible. I'm not minimizing the death of of, of civilians, but they voted for Hamas, uh, you know, a, a lot right. of them. And, and, and again, they shouldn't be killed necessarily because they're voting for Hamas. But all of that to say Israel isn't doing anything any differently. And just to let you know, the world is going crazy. And unfortunately, our government with Biden at the head is going crazy right along with them. And so you have to be prepared for that. Last thing, RC, um, actually a couple more things real quickly here. Um, sure. The state of Washington puts gun buyers on the hook. Talk to us about that story, if you will. That was also, too, if you go to Sherlock.substack. Dot com rip from the headlines. Uh, you can find that uh, in RC and Juliana Substack. Uh, so check that out, Sherlock.substack.com. But talk to us about that, RC. Yeah, so it's crazy, Carl. That story is actually about gun manufacturers. So you've got this combination. The state of Washington has, has largely gone crazy. Blessings to my brothers and sisters on the conservative side in the state of Washington. But what's happening in Olympia, the capital, is absolute insanity. And so basically what the Washington legislature said is that if a criminal goes out and commits a crime with a Smith and Wesson, whoever that crime is committed against can sue Smith and Wesson for negligence and can go after them. So here we are in a place now where on the surface they say, we're going to get those darn guns and that's the key to safety. And, And as we said, look, if you would actually address the issue of law and rule enforcement, Because, see, the bad guys don't follow the rules. So you can ban guns or do this all day. It's not going to stop a criminal from grabbing a weapon and and going to town if that's where their their heart is, unfortunately, because their heart is wicked, right? This happens. They they need help. They need to be saved. There needs to be rules in place and a a deterrent so that they don't do those things. But the state of Washington said, listen, the gun manufacturer is actually the enemy. So here's what's crazy, Carl. That's going to open up a can of worms that I don't think the state of Washington expected. So... Most people use the analogy of, well, then if if the car hits someone, it's the car manufacturer's fault. So if if I'm driving a, a Mercedes and I hit Carl in an intersection, is he going to sue me or my insurance? Is he going to go after Mercedes? Right. Well, now he can go after both, right. even though Mercedes simply sold the vehicle and that was it. Here's the flip side of it in the state of Washington. So basically what this says is that if we lived in Washington, Carl, you and your family and your youngest, they had talk to her or him about transgender stuff, right? And let's say, unfortunately, they did a procedure on them. Well, then the law would basically say, you'd say, well, listen, um, I think the manufacturer of the surgical tools and the medications are at fault here. So I'm going to sue all of them. And you would have a case based on the precedent that Washington has created with gun manufacturers. Look, Carl, states have tried this before. Washington managed to get it through. It is inherently dangerous And what's going to happen, Washington legislators who are super liberal are going to learn the hard way, is that once you open this can of worms, people's interpretation is going to go all sideways, just like the example I gave you with with a young person and this quote unquote transitioning. They're, They're going to use it for advantage and it's going to clog up the court system with a bunch of foolishness and it's just going to create it's going to create a mess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, everything it's like Dennis Prager says, everything the left touches, they destroy 
Um, and man, they are destroying your, your, your second amendment. They are destroying privacy. They are destroying this country little by little. You know, it's, it, it's funny to me that, uh, you know, this, this is random, but I'll, I'll be talking about this Fonnie Willis case and, uh, Trump's, you know, bloodbath statement, this fake outrage from the left. Uh, it, it, it's funny to me how all of these people sit and try to undermine America, talk bad about America. And I'm sitting here thinking, can you please name anywhere else in the world or even or in world history, world history for that matter, where a nation has developed a bill of rights for the citizens, where the citizens are the ones that are empowered, that are that are not served. I don't care if it's Africa. I don't care if it's Europe. I don't care if it's Asia. Name anywhere in the world where that has happened, where the <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm just I, I get so. It's so crazy, RC, because just on just being real, like even from I even from last year to this year, I, I got to be honest with you, man. I you know, I, I, I'm human, too. And, and I, I've just grown so I can't believe even though I'm in this fight and I will continue to fight. But there are days where I'm right. like, I cannot believe where we are. Not just in the world. I expect the world to act like the world, is, so to speak. Um, and I'm speaking secularly. I'm not even speaking biblically. But to see Americans just being willing to throw the greatest experiment ever away, I have to admit, even to me, some days I just wake up and I'm 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 a little depressed. And I'm like, I, I, I can't believe we're living through this. But, you know, I know that God has called us for such a time as this, but it, it's, it's just crazy. Even I get overwhelmed with this stuff. It, it's hard not to Carl. And, you know, Bill Federer said something in our interview that I, I think is very timely. He talked about the structure of the United States and, and I'll, I'll go to a biblical worldview because I think part of the challenge, Carl, like you said, you know, why would people give up these incredible freedoms? And with this grand experiment is because they're so far removed from it. They've forgotten what it took to get there. So, so Bill Federer made a great analogy. He said that if you think about the structure of the United States and how our laws and rules were designed by the framers, it really does come from the Bible, but it comes from the period of 400 years where there was no king. So God, the king of kings, put together a set of laws, people followed them, and they had no need for a king. The difference between a constitutional republic, which does yeah. that, and a monarchy is that a monarchy looks at the Bible from the rule of King Saul on, right? right? Monarchy, Man. constitutional republic. Right. You see the difference. Both are steeped in scripture. They just choose to pull from different places. Mm. In the prior example with the constitutional republic, notice there was no king because there was no need for one because the king of kings laid the rules and everybody followed them. Guess what happened? They were able to self-govern based on the rule of law that came from the king of kings. But when man steps in, you end up with these monarchies and kingdoms. And again, that's how the United States got created. Religious freedom was important to the Puritans. They told King George or whoever to pound sand, and they hit, they hit the rocks. They decided to come across, right? That's how this all started. It's a good breakdown. So the, yeah, the more that people, listen, even if you're not a believer, right? Okay, fine. But don't deny the historical fact and the logic of how we got here. Because if you actually take the time to do that, one, you'll figure out there are no atheists in foxholes. That's yep. an old saying. But in reality, you'll better understand why we operate the way we do and just how precious and important your freedom is. But you'll also be able to identify why this type of stuff is happening because someone's trying to take it from you. Yeah, good stuff, man. Good stuff, RC. Um, I was going to talk to you about the realtor thing, but I, I, I mean, if you want to chime off on that, this latest settlement, I, I don't, I don't know how much it'll impact the markets, but it, 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 it might. So yeah, why, why don't you just give us your take? And for those of you that might not be aware, um, there was a settlement reach. Let me find it real quick. Over, I believe it occurred on Friday. I'm sorry, I literally have like, I'm trying not to because. 
I'm not using the laptop that I typically do for the podcast. So I usually have a thousand things up on this laptop and a thousand things up on my phone. Uh, so that's what you guys are dealing with when you deal with me. I, I have like articles that I'll read, that I'll reread, that I'll print out and put notes on and all this kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, OK, here it is. Uh, realtor settlement. Let me just click on it here. This this is from CNN.com. Carl, you were, and listen, I got to tell you guys something. This is the craziest thing. Um, CNN.com, uh, CNN, I wouldn't watch it. All right. Reading their articles, th they're always going to be slanted left. All right. But you, you know that going in. Sometimes their articles are very informative. It's weird. It's the same thing with CBS News. Wouldn't watch them for, you know, for a hill of beans. But when you read their material, the, the left wing slant is easy. You can just kind of move it aside, uh, but it also gives good in information. All right. So this is this is the headline. How the recent realtor settlement could change the way Americans buy and sell homes. Uh, a settlement announced by the National Association of Realtors on Friday ended its litigation with some home sellers uh, that could fundamentally change how Americans buy and sell their homes. The agreement will effectively destroy the rules that many critics say help drive home prices higher. The new rules are likely to be fair for home buyers and sellers who've been saddled with the most unaffordable housing market in a generation, according to the article. But even after the $418 million settlement goes into effect in July, after court approval, some things will remain familiar. Commissions aren't disappearing, for one, and they'll still be negotiable. Sellers and buyers agents will still be able to split commissions. Uh, here's what the changes will mean, however. One new rule will prohibit agents' compensation from being included on listings on local portals known as multiple listing services. Critics say doing that in the past led some brokers to steer their clients toward properties that could earn heftier commissions. Another change is requirements that brokers subscribe to multiple listing services, many of which are owned by the National Association of Realtors subsidiaries. And that's a that's a that's a mouthful, obviously, RC, because I'm reading directly from the column. I gotta tell you, I don't know. To be honest, if if this is good or bad, I, I, my 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 initial my initial thoughts are, I I don't I don't know that this does anything, except eventually, I I, I think potentially hurt the real estate market. I, I I think you need those bulldogs in the real estate in the real estate market, and I think buyers need to be more aware of who they're they're hiring, but I could be completely off. It's just my initial reaction, just reacting to what I read. But your initial thoughts, RC? Yeah, so you've got like a tri-side problem, Carl, and I'll, I'll work to break these down quickly. Um, on, on the front end, you've got the, you're putting, basically you're putting a Band-Aid uh, on, on someone who's gone in for open heart surgery. Right. So instead of actually fixing that wound, you're just putting a Band-Aid over it. Look, the challenge with the housing market is that it's out of control right now. But the larger issue with that is the economy itself. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this is part of a much, much larger and more nefarious plot to make housing or the home ownership completely unaffordable because you'll own nothing and you'll be mm -hmm. happy. People make fun of that and they joke about that, that video that came out from the World Economic Forum. Listen, these people aren't joking with you. And if you're not going to comply willingly, they're going to force you into compliance. So the settlement, right, these settlements run through the courts and everything. Those fines are a cost of doing business. I would agree with you that I don't know that it changes much on a, a, a realtor side or whatever. Should buyers and sellers be more aware? Absolutely, they should. But I wonder what it does for that business as a whole. Because today, you start to wonder, you see a house on the market, you see this, you see that. And I say to myself, how does the average American even afford this today? Yeah. This is absolutely yeah, insane. Is. Like, how are they even going to afford it? So what good does a settlement do? Maybe, maybe it puts bad actors more in line or they figure out a new way to skirt the law. But Carl, it doesn't address the fundamental yeah. issue. The average American is being priced out of the housing market by design. And guess who's buying up those houses, Carl? Yeah, it's going to be the same people, the big investors, the big hedge funds. Right. Yeah. They they did. They're doing the same thing they did to you after the financial crisis of 2008. Right. When these American Homes for Rent or some of these other groups came in and they bought up a bunch of single family homes on the cheap. Right. Or they priced people out of the market and then they rented them at exorbitant rates. 
made a huge profit, took those companies public, right? Once they took them public, they took their money off the table. They ran them into the ground, sent them into bankruptcy, and then they bought them out again for pennies on the <laughs> dollar. So they can do the exact same thing that they're doing to you right now, because what you don't see right, is the underlying story. So we talked about the economic yeah. issue. What's happening underneath, Carl, that keeps getting buried is the fact these same corporations are going and doing the same thing. Yeah, it's amazing. And then now when I think about this further, you blame the middleman, you blame the, the real estate agent that's able to collect if they're selling and uh, if they're helping with you, uh, helping you with a sale and buy, they can collect, I believe, up to 6% commission, um, you know, if, if, mm -hmm. if I'm correct. And that can be cut potentially uh, in in half, but but you're absolutely right. right. I, uh, honestly, I think real estate agents, if you get a good one, I think they're worth the value. Uh, in in my mm -hmm. opinion, because in the long run, they help you to avoid uh, some of the upheavals in the real estate uh, industry. And so, I think that's a, I, I, I think that's a smart thing to do. Frankly, to hire a good real estate agent. But I understand that some people will disagree with that. But on the, I think you're right. In 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 the long run, RC, I'm not. I, I, I think the ones that benefit from this potentially are going to be the same old people that have benefited before as you're being the regular average everyday Joe is being priced out of the housing market. So anyway, something for you guys out there to uh, to contemplate. Sometimes sometimes what sounds like a win may not necessarily be a, be a win. You just got to think through this stuff, pray through this stuff. Um, and just keep in mind, we're dealing with a bunch of evil people <laughs> that literally that literally want us to be subservient to them. It's weird. They don't believe in God. Uh, they believe they are gods and they want you to serve them. And honestly, guys, I know sometimes some of this conversation sounds wacky. It's not. That's where we are today. It really is. Anyway, R.C. Williams, Sherlock.substack.com. We are Watchmen.substack.com. Anywhere else for, where people can go to find you, R.C.? Uh, those are the two best places, Carl, from either one of those sub stacks, people can get to the rest of our information, including the other newsletter. Uh, we just strongly encourage people, uh, read, get yourself up to speed. Subscribing to those newsletters will do a lot for you, and they're easily shareable. And that's the big one for us, Carl. If you've got this information, obviously, we encourage you to prepare, and we provide resources on both sides to do that. But we even more strongly encourage you to share this with other people, because the more people that we can get aware, the less issues we have when things go sideways. The more prepared people are, the better. And a quick analogy, the... Uh, the financial crisis of the stock market crash of 1929, the majority of the country was actually self-sufficient. And that was the thing that saved a lot of people is that hard days weren't unfamiliar mm. to them. So they were prepared. Communities were That's prepared. And while it was difficult, Carl, right? Not everyone starved to death because people were prepared. And that was like 80% of the population. Now you've got maybe 10% or less of the population. Yeah, who, who is is in that place. So we strongly encourage people, the, the fastest way to do this is you get educated, you share with someone else, get them educated, and you're both getting prepared. And that shows a community to get prepared. That shows the church that they need to get prepared. And guess what? When they try to bring the hammer down on us, we're at least insulated somewhat from that yeah, blow. Good, good, good words, good sound advice there. And I know some Christians are out there, well, I'm just going to pray for Jesus to come. All right, I get it. Uh, but things can get very bad, <laughs> right? <laughs> where, where, uh, and you know what? Frankly, I do believe it should be Christians that step up and be the ones that 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 help their neighbors out uh, and be the most prepared for situations like this. Frankly, even though you're, we're waiting on Jesus. That 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 isn't an, uh, that isn't the Bible doesn't give us permission uh, to, to, to stop being prepared here on earth. I don't know where that comes from in the Christian faith, but some people just feel that way. Carl, yes. Carl, occupy until I come. Mm, good. If people look up the origin of the word, the Lord didn't tell us to have idle hands. He told us to do work and make disciples until he, it's time for him to come back because Jesus doesn't know either. He hasn't gotten the word from the father. That's why he said, listen, no man knows the day or the hour. I will get off my Bible tangent, but I think it's important for Christians especially to understand there's two problems. One, you're not being biblical if you're sitting around saying, oh God, I'm going to wait for Jesus to come. And two, you're setting a really bad example to people who are skeptical or who are questioning when that's your answer to the question. Mm. Stop doing that. Man. Be If you're going to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, then do what he did 
and do what he said. Once you do that, magical things happen. People start to listen to you. Things actually move in your life. It's a magical process, Carl, when you actually follow the word. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Amen. Good stuff, RC. Good stuff, man. Way to way to close it out. All right, guys, I appreciate you tuning in to this edition of the Carl Jackson Show podcast. Please, again, subscribe to the podcast wherever you go to get your podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and Rumble. Uh, also, please, uh, if you're on YouTube, if you're on Rumble, if you're watching the video uh, version of the podcast, would you please review the podcast? Would you share the podcast? Obviously, subscribe to the podcast. But as you review it, you give us a five, I believe it is. That's going to help us. That's going to help more people become excited exposed to the program we would certainly appreciate that all things social media at the carl jackson show i'm on x instagram facebook true social getter wherever i am on social media the carl jackson show is where you can find me again you can check out rc's work sherlock spelled s-h-e-r-l-o-c dot substack dot com also we are watchmen dot substack dot com rc williams god bless you man thank you for uh uh, thank you for joining us today and wish your wife a belated happy birthday for me. All right. I know you guys celebrated yesterday because RC totally dissed me and refused to come on to the program yesterday. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Carl, brother, we love you and we appreciate you. Thank you. for All right, me. man. God bless you, man. You take care. God bless.